Omaha's news leader, chronicling the stories and people making a difference in our community. This is KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. Hey, good morning. I'm Rob McCartney. This is KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. Between now and the May primary, we're devoting all of our shows to the upcoming election, part of our year long commitment to covering the issues and candidates running in 2018. And the race for Nebraska's U.S. Senate seat is packed. There are five Republicans, including incumbent Deb Fisher and Dennis Machek, who we'll be talking with today. On the Democratic side, there are four candidates running, including Frank Swoboda, who is not pictured here. Also, one Libertarian, Jim Schultz. I want to begin this morning with incumbent Republican Senator Deb Fisher. Thanks for being here today. I really appreciate you coming in. have a lot we want to talk about. First off, I want to know why do you want to go back for another six years? We have a lot of work to do. You know, we've accomplished a lot together working with Nebraskans. We've done a highway bill. We've gotten funding for health research. We've addressed human trafficking and sex trafficking. We've looked at opioid abuse. We, we've done a lot of things, but there's a lot more to do. We need to continue to address infrastructure. We need to look at a, at a farm bill that's coming up. I just got on the Ag Committee, so I'm very excited to have Nebraska at the table and be involved with that. So I think look, looking at what's ahead, looking at the accomplishments we've done, my husband and I visited. We decided there was still more work to do, and so I'm running again for the Senate. Okay, you mentioned the Ag Committee, and this is a very interesting time to be on yeah. the Ag Committee with all the tariff talk between U.S. and uh, China. President Trump's looking at adding another $100 billion in tariffs uh, on Chinese products. Your colleague, Senator Sass, wrote, uh, this is nuts. The president's threatening to light American agriculture on fire and that this is the dumbest possible way to do this when talking about dealing with China. Do uh, you agree? You know, I've been uh, discussing trade issues with the administration for about a year now. There are six of us senators who have been extremely focused on NAFTA. We met with the president uh, before December at the White House. We had lunch with him on it. And I explained to him the really negative impact on announcing you're going to pull out of NAFTA, what that does to the state of Nebraska. Mm -hmm. It affects agriculture, it affects our farmers, but it affects the state of Nebraska. We've had some good progress in our discussions there. So I'm, I'm somewhat hopeful as we move forward on that, but I, I am very concerned with the actions we've seen from the Chinese and their retaliation measures the last couple days. Uh, that's been tough. You know, I've talked on the phone with Sonny Perdue, the mm -hmm. Ag Secretary. Uh, we had the Under Secretary for Trade here in Omaha a couple days ago, spoke to him about it, uh, spoke to the administration. I've suggested another face-to-face -face meeting with Ag Senators so that we can explain to the President again and give him information now on the Chinese situation, on how we think we should move forward. There's a 30-day period here mm -hmm. where it's a comment period and, um, and things can change. And so I'm going to continue to push the administration, be uh, blunt with the president, as I always am, and, um, and see what we can do to, to make sure that ag's not going to be hit so hard. What did Se uh, Secretary Purdue tell you when you told Did he just listen or is he, did he respond? Uh, the secretary is a great advocate for agriculture. His first visit after he was uh, uh, confirmed was out to our ranch in Cherry County. He wanted to meet with livestock producers. He wanted to be able to have a visit. So mm -hmm. we woke up to snow that morning, but we had about 60, 70 neighbors who visited with the secretary. And trade was a big issue there yeah. and spoke to him about it. So he's a great advocate for that. Uh, he said that the president gave him a message, and that was that he was going to take care of farmers and ranchers. And I smiled, and I said, well, I hope, hope you hold him to it, because he told me that same message in December when we had lunch at the White House. And he said to me, Deb, I'm going to take care of farmers and ranchers. And I said, Mr. President, I will hold you to that. Okay. Let's go through some of the issues. Economy, this is uh, related, obviously. Deficit last fiscal year was $666 billion. The debt topped $21 trillion. Those are staggering numbers. Uh, are you okay with those numbers? And if not, I assume you're not, what would you do to change them? Yeah, of course I'm not okay with those numbers. I voted no in the omnibus bill. We can't continue to see this spending. I have co-sponsored a balanced budget amendment. I just saw in the news today that the House is going to take up the balanced budget uh, amendment in the House, and I hope we do that in the Senate as well. 
Uh, we need to make some big changes in how we decide spending by the federal government. What, what we do now um, doesn't work. It adds to the deficit, it adds to the debt. It's one reason I voted no on, on the omnibus. Uh, we can't continue down that path. We need to just take up individual spending bills and make the tough decisions on which programs we're going to spend and which ones we're not. 1.3 trillion, is that, yeah, 1.3 trillion federal budget. A lot of conservatives, now that they're going back into their districts, are hearing uh, unhappy constituents, yeah. and we'll put it that way. How can you justify voting for it? I didn't. I mean, I mean for, <laughs> for passing it, for being yeah. even in the battle, I mean, for not getting it stopping it or cutting the spending even further. Yeah, you know, I, I supported a lot that was in the, in the omnibus. For mm -hmm. one thing, the military spending. Right. I'm fourth in seniority on the Armed Services Committee. I chair the subcommittee that has jurisdiction over STRATCOM and nuclear modernization, missile defense. These are all priorities for the United States, looking at a pay raise for our military. We've been trying to do that for several years. That was in it. So no, it was a tough vote for me um, not to support many, many things in the military spending that I've worked on for six years. Mm -hmm. But we have to stop, uh, stop the insanity, stop the nonsense, make some changes. And the more of us, I think, that stand up um, and say that, to leadership that, you know, we're tired of four people getting in a room and doing this, um, we'll see some changes. And I see, I see a, a growing discontent within the Republican Senate caucus as we, uh, as we meet. So I, I think you're going to see some changes coming forward to help lessen um, time that it takes on the floor to get things done in the Senate. And I, and I hope we're going to see changes on how we address spending. Would you uh, uh, support a rollback, rolling back some of the budget? I know you have like 45 days to, to do that. What I, what I support is being able to take up individual appropriations bills. Every year for the past 54 years, I think, we've passed the National Defense Authorization Act. That's what we do in Armed Services Committee. And the Senate passed it by 70-some votes. Last year, we tried five or six times to get 60 votes to be able to take up the appropriations bills. So on one hand, you have senators saying, oh, I support the military. I voted for the NDAA. But then they don't vote to, author to appropriate spending for the programs they've, that they've supported. I don't know how they go um, back to their districts and say, I support the military when they will not support taking up appropriations bills and doing this in a rational, sensible manner. That's what we need to get back to. It hasn't happened for decades, but there is a very strong push, very strong push now within the Republican conference to do that. You mentioned defense. Uh, yeah. The talk of using the military to protect the border uh, with Mexico. Do you support calling a National Guard for that or using defense spending to, to help solidify the southern border? You know, we've seen that in the past. We saw President Obama um, send troops to the border, also President Bush. I haven't seen a plan yet from President Trump. Uh, I like to have facts before me before I make a decision, so I'd like to see the details of any kind of plan. I am concerned about um, movement of numbers, so it would have to be a pretty compelling argument to transfer spending that we desperately need for our military men and women for their readiness to defend this country uh, to, the, to a, a border situation, there'd, there'd have to be a pretty compelling argument for me. What do you do with DACA? With DACA, we've tried to address that. In um, about three, three, four weeks ago, we had a vote on it. I supported Senator Grassley's amendment, which really uh, stressed border security. It was what President Trump supported in his State of the Union speech. So there was $25 billion for border security, whether it was a wall, a fence, technology, more border patrol. They even had a biometric entry-exit system in there, which I have advocated for since my first year in the Senate. So that was important. And then with the DACA recipients, it, it provided certainty to 1.8 million DACA recipients in this country, a pathway to citizenship. I supported that. Uh, we got about half the Republicans to support it. We only got three Democrats. You know, if we could have gotten half the Democrats, we could have gotten that done. 
Gun control. Is there any middle ground? And we just got a couple minutes left. And in, yeah. any middle ground when dealing with whether teachers should be armed or whether there should be stricter gun control? Well, first of all, uh, I think it's up to individual school districts how they make that decision. But a couple of weeks ago, I had a round table here in Omaha. We met with with law enforcement, mental health providers, and also school people. And what we were looking for were solutions. And obviously, it's school safety. Mm -hmm. How do we keep our kids safe and our schools secure? And, and we discussed many things there. But we also talked about the need to provide more mental health care providers. Um, there's a shortage here in the state of Nebraska, and there's some ways we can look at that. So I'm, um, I'm excited to be able to work with this group in, in coming up with solutions. Okay. Well, we don't have much time left. I want to give you a minute okay. to make a pitch to your potential voters, your constituents, so you can look right at the camera there and go ahead. Okay. Well, I just want to say to people that I thank them for the support that they've given me. Together, we've been able to be very, very effective in the United States Senate. You know, we work hard. We've gotten things done. Uh, we have a great record on getting things done, whether it's a highway bill, uh, looking at funding for for research, uh, looking at things for Omaha. I worked hard to get the runway taken care of it off at Air Force Base. We're taking care of our vets here in Omaha with, with the bill that we passed. Uh, and we also passed a water infrastructure bill that protects the drinking water for two-thirds of the people in the state of Nebraska and for people right here in Omaha. I want to continue that work. I want to continue to work with Nebraskans, listen to their thoughts and ideas, and continue to be effective in the United States Senate and get things done for the state. So I want to fight for you. Thanks. All right. Senator Fisher, thanks very much. Thank you. Up next, we'll be talking with Republican Dennis Macek. You're watching KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. You're watching KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. This morning, we're talking with two more of the 10 candidates running for Senate. And joining me now is Republican Dennis Macek. Dennis, thanks very much for joining us this morning. My pleasure. First off, why are you running? Well, this may sound corny. I'm running because of love. I love Nebraska. I love this country. I love the, the world. I see what's going on. I think I know what has to be done to rectify what is going on and to... In, enhance our lives, and uh, it's incumbent upon me to do something about it. And this is the only way I can think to do to do that best. Your your bio: you are an author. You've yes. written some books. Sure. Uh, understand you're also. You, what, what else have you done? Oh my goodness! I was a college English professor, uh, e English teacher, okay. English teacher. Um, I worked for the federal government in some mid-level positions. Three of them. Uh, I became an air conditioning technician so that I could write. I'm a retired air conditioning technician. Okay. How does that get you to a running for Senate in Nebraska? That's it. Love. It comes down to that. Um, and once again, love for the land, love for the country. And along with that is um, apprehension. Um, I fear for the future of the country and of everybody unless certain things are done. Okay, so on one hand it's love, on the other hand apprehension, fear. And I know something has to be done. I think I know what it is. I think I know how to do it. And then there's this other, there's a little undercurrent of, of anger. That's how, got, how that got me into standing for the U.S. Senate. Okay. Your platform, you look at it, says your campaign motto, smarter spending, clean energy, new business, no excuses. Let's go through some of them. The economy. As for the spending, the federal government finished fiscal 2017 with a budget deficit of $666 billion. That was $80 billion more than 2016. The debt itself is a little over $21 trillion. It was a 3% increase in spending. And then we only took in, though, about a third of that, 1%. From your perspective, with all those numbers out there, what's wrong here? What's the solution? Okay, what's wrong here is we lack proportionality. We lack re reality. Okay, and the solution is proportionality. For instance, if the federal budget were $1, 20 nickels, it's a matter of allocating those 20 nickels among our, our top priorities, um, among our priorities. Mm -hmm. And in, indeed, my... My platform is to foster and fight for 12 national priorities as I see them. Okay, so it's a, it's a matter then of apportioning those 20 nickels over those 12 priorities. 
and and that's an end to it. But right now we have spending that is going up, I know receipts that. going down, or not going, not not keeping pace. How do you balance that? Um, by determining what the budget, what what our what our budget is going to be for the year, and apportion those nickels of that dollar accordingly. Okay. Um, should Washington adopt a balanced budget amendment with that in mind? No, not yet. Why not? Eventually, because we can't yet. It's 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 too uh, it's too drastic. I'd say three years, four years, five years. We work our way toward that. But we can't do it now. It's impossible. It's, it, it's, uh, it's just not realistic to try to do that now. But four or five years down the pike, definitely. Okay. President Trump had passed the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Would you have supported that? For the most part, yes. Uh, to a, a, a large degree, no. Uh, because it's not as simple as it looks. There are a lot of loopholes. Um, and um, besides the loopholes, it increases the, the, uh, the projected deficit too much. I mean, the projected uh, deficit too much mm -hmm. uh, debt. So uh, we, we, couldn't, we, we can't do all that the budget calls for. For the most part, I like it, especially the pass-through. I know we have to lower the corporate taxes. We shouldn't lower them quite that much because that's, that's, that's going to be increasing the deficit, uh, the, the, the debt. The debt, right. The debt. So would I have voted for it? Ultimately, probably. But I don't like parts of it. I don't, uh, especially the loopholes, and especially how complicated it is, and especially given that the corporate tax break a little bit too high. I mean, too much of a of a, of a cut. And there's one thing else too, and this really bugs me. They got that Arctic oil drilling thing into into uh, the, the tax reform. Okay, so that's going to enable uh, drilling in the Arctic. Um, that's ridiculous. That leads me into the, one of your other issues is clean energy. Uh, you want to talk about that. Uh, you said, you're quoted saying, more important than everything is the mandate to build the U.S. economy on exclusive use of renewable sources of energy with urgency, and it's not going to happen unless the federal government leads the way. True. How do you lead the way? You lead the way by, very simply, coming up with uh, pr proposing legislation and fighting for the legislation that will enable us to do that. Okay, do what? implement the technology that's already on hand to convert to a, a, a basically what they call a green economy. Okay, the technology is already out there. We can do that right now. Technology is getting better and better and better. Um, and uh, within, a, a, oh, I, I don't know, a year or two, we should know exactly what technology to implement and we should be implementing it. And, and how, what, what and how to implement it. We should know this within a year or two. Okay, that's the transition that we have to make. It's almost exactly like and indeed, it is, it, it is exactly like the way the United States converted um, its, all the energy, uh, all our manufacturing, uh, all our, um, uh, the whole economy to a wartime economy during World War II. Hmm. It's the same thing, except uh, um, not quite as urgently. Okay. Would you have supported President Trump's uh, pulling out of the Paris Climate Accord? Hell, heck no. Well, why not? <laughs> Of course not, because that's, it's crucial to uh, saving the, the, the world's, it's crucial to arresting global climate change. Mm -hmm. Global climate change is the paramount issue of our time. No matter how we deal with the economy, no matter how we deal with terrorism, uh, no matter how we deal with all the social issues, the most important thing down the pike is survival, and survival depends on arresting global climate change, and we can't arrest global climate change by by not changing our ways. Gotcha. Let me ask you about business, one of the other parts of your platform. What do you plan to do in Washington to bring new business to Nebraska? Oh, to bring new business in Nebraska, to Nebraska. Well, oh, the potential for clean energy uh, generation in Nebraska, the, potentially, the potential is unlimited. Okay, well, as it is, we have uh, uh, the Facebook uh, uh, data center in Papillion, okay. We should be attracting more, uh, more industry like that to the state because we have the resources, we have the sunshine, we have the wind. We've got the second most, this is the sunniest, except for Florida, this is the sunshine state. And we got the wind. We can attract um, green technology. We got, uh, any kind of business that relies on green technology or that generates green technology, we can attract it here. Okay. And that's what I would do. Let me ask you about immigration. I mean, DACA is a huge issue right now. What's your solution? Uh, so the solution is restore DACA, absolutely. Um, 
That's all I can say about DACA. Do you agree with the pathway to citizenship? Yes. Okay, and some of the people in the Republican Party would disagree with that, that process. Why? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I don't know either. <laughs> but you're perfectly fine with restoring all DACA and handling the Dreamers. Definitely. Okay. Let's uh, Hold move it. on. Oh, they are good. us. Okay. I can't throw them out or give them a sh give them short shrift. They are us, of course. Okay. Let me ask about gun control. Should teachers be armed? No. Not at all. No, I bet you there's not a teacher around. If you took ten teachers, how many would you do? You, how many of you all say it's okay to be armed, or would, or you think it's a it's a good idea to be armed? Nine out of those ten would say, "Don't be silly." I would say the same thing. Would you touch the Second Amendment at all with the people protesting, saying something needs to be changed? Would you touch the Second Amendment? As is worded, no. But I would surely foster and fight for legislation that bans assault weapons, any assault mm -hmm. weapons, be they howitzers that you mount on your front porch, be it bazookas, be it hand grenades, be it rocket-propelled grenade launchers, mm -hmm. be it automatic ref, uh, rifles, uh, any, any kind of assault weapons should be banned. Why? Public safety also is a matter of morality. And one more, one more final question I want to ask you about. Uh, dealing with that, homegrown terrorism. Some people say, where do you draw the line between stopping terrorists and protecting civil liberties, private personal liberties? Where do you draw that line? I don't know that the line has to be drawn. So what would you do? About what? About homegrown terrorists. Say, for example, the Austin City bomber. Well, you find out who the person or the people are as best you can and uh, apprehend them. I don't know where the issue lies, frankly. Okay. If it's sort of like dealing with bank robbers. You, somebody's planning a big heist, you find out about it and you stop it. Same for homegrown terrorists. You find out about them and you stop them. Okay. Well, we don't have much time left. We want to give you a minute to make a final pitch to your, to your uh, constituents and your prospective voters. So right here to the camera, go ahead. Okay, vote. That's my first thing, vote. Vote realistically. Vote not for me, but for my platform. My platform uh, basically is to foster and fight for 12 national priorities. Uh, they are encapsulated in my campaign motto. My campaign motto is smarter spending, clean energy, new business, no excuses. Okay, your country needs your vote for my platform. Nebraska needs your vote. Your children and your children's children need you to vote realistically. For love of God and God's creation and God's children, all God's children, vote realistically. Vote for the future. And that's all I have to say, sir. Thank you very much for the interview. Best My of luck to you. Well, best of luck with getting my platform propounded, okay. uh, promulgated. We're gonna, gotcha. We're going to be back with some final thoughts. First, a reminder, your comments are an important part of the show. If you want to be heard, email them to news at KETV.com. Remember, we love hearing from you, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to the special Commitment 2018 edition of KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. For the next two weeks, we'll be talking with the final candidates running for U.S. Senate. Today, we talked with the Republicans, Senator Deb Fischer and Dennis Maciek. Their interviews are online, along with the candidates we talked with the past couple of weeks. Republican Jack Heidel, Democrats Chris Janicek and Larry Marvin, and Libertarian Jim Schultz. We here at KETV News Watch 7 want you to be well informed when you vote May 15th. I'm Rob McCartney. Thanks for watching. We'll see you back here next Sunday morning.